Cool. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Jin. I'm a year four student at NUS, and um, so I mean, in NUS, when you're doing computer science, you kind of have to choose uh, a, a focus area that you want to do by year two or year three. So I decided to choose on focus on PL, and um, no regrets. It's uh, it's one of the disciplines where like I can inter like I learn a lot about computer science where in, like it intersects with math and CS and all the philosophy areas and just every day every day when I new read a new paper it's like incredible. It's like feels feels like magic. And um so you might be wondering why is there this picture here? Why do I use this picture as a title picture? So for those who of you who have not read the paper it's actually all the way at the back where Philip Wettler, the author makes a point about it. Uh which we I'll, I'll get to later. But uh so the author, Philip Wettler He's a professor at uh, University of Edinburgh, and uh, if you've any done any Haskell or Java, you might have used his work before. Um, he did a lot of work on type classes and monads and uh, generics in Java, and he contributed a lot to the functional programming theory, even PL theory uh, universe. Um, so he looks like that, and that's a Lambda Man uh, yes. shirt. <laughs> so, yeah, not sure if you can get it online, but uh, anyway, so um, the TLDR on this paper is actually I was when I when I was reading this paper I, I was expecting it to be very um, technically complex, but it turns out to be more of like a history paper and overview of computer science than an actual CS paper. So as a as a student, I thought like this this was like a very good introduction to the world of fundamental theoretical science. Um, but anyway, let's start maybe with the first line of the paper, uh, which basically says, uh, powerful insights arise from linking two fields of study previously from uh, thought separate. Because um, everyone decide, everyone's like, you know, when you are starting, when learn, learning a field, you tend to focus in one area. And when you realize that this other area comes in and interacts and fits very well with the area they're working on, it kind of makes you feel a bit odd, like how did these two fields that seem totally disconnected work so well together? So in other words, um, from now, from the, from, for, for, the, for, for the purpose of this uh, talk, I'm going to use the word correspondence a lot, just to uh, make it simpler. Uh, connections between fields, so for example, we have in quantum physics, you have uh, particles and waves, uh, where uh, uh, when this, when 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 this thing happened, there was a huge revelation in the physics community. Um, geometry and algebra using uh, Cartesian coordinates, um, and also philosophy and computer science, which, which is what we're talking going to talk about. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about formal logic and the idea of computation, uh, and which is propositions and types. The title of the, the talk. So propositions and types is, uh, as, is, as described by Philip Weller, it's a notion with a lot of depth in the sense that um, we are not just linking these two fields on a very surface level. It actually goes all the way down uh, in these three levels. I'm going to talk about these three levels later. Uh, it's also a notion with breath. Um, in a sense that it touches a lot of areas around computer science um, and logic. So if you have taken any basic logic courses or PL courses or even wrote in a functional language, um, these are probably some words that you have seen before. Um, for example, um, like second order logic corresponds with like polymorphism and uh, parametricity. And uh, it's, it, it just touches almost everything that if you have ever programmed like in a, a, a functional language before, it touches that. And um, uh, yeah, and these are some of the languages that came up of this whole uh, correspondence. For example, um, Agda, Cog, New Pearl, and uh, all this. These are all like proof assistants and theorem provers where like, companies that 
really need to verify the code or like do formal verification. They actually need all these things. So somewhere out there in uh, in a rocket, there's there, there's running code that has been formally verified, and these all have leads back up to uh, this this notion. And thirdly, uh, it's also a notion with mystery. Um, to explain what, why this is a mystery, I have to go to a bit of detail, a bit of history in this whole story. Um, so there's actually a lot of people involved in the build-up of this story. Um, so way back, the formulation of logic, Aristotle, and then a lot of people, and then in the 19th century, there was Bo, the Morgan piano. Um, this is just, you know, like there wasn't really a formalization of logic up to, up to maybe 20th, 20th century when um, David Hubert came in and asked about this question, the Ein Shai Dong's problem. It sounds... It, they make it sound yeah. It it sounds better if you pronounce it. Right. So the idea is that uh, can we formalize the whole of mathematics with a consistent set of axiom? Correct me. Correct me if I'm wrong because like I'm very new to this. But uh, uh, he wants to write a program that could take in any program in the world, uh, and then decides and then uh, uh, ask if we can decide on it. So basically, if uh, if it's true or it's false. But turns out that uh, Godot came in and said, no, you cannot do that with his incompleteness theorem, that uh, you cannot have uh, <laughs> any logic that can be represented as an arithmetic cannot, will be incomplete. This is what, the, yeah. So, um, this was a pretty big thing because after this, after Gödel came up with the incompleteness theorem, uh, Alonso, Ch uh, Alonso Church actually came up with the lambda calculus, which is kind of like a way to do, to represent computation. Um, if you're not familiar with lambda calculus, uh, this, is, this is like a modern, modern like representation of lambda calculus where you have a variable, you have functions, that takes in uh, any uh, variables and then you have function application at the back. So any language, it's kind of like a universal representation of a computation. Um, and the thing is, originally Alonso Church didn't decide to use lambda calculus as a form of computation. It's more like a, a new representation of logic. And also, in his, there's, there's this line at the back of his, at the end of this paper that says, or maybe there's some other usage of this lambda calculus. Um, uh, and who knew? Like um, the okay, so if you're familiar with uh, the Russell's paradox, which is um, this whole thing just means like what uh, for R is a set of R is a set of sets that do not include itself. So if R is if R includes itself, it should not be in this set, but it's in this set. So there's a paradox involved, and with this paradox, you cannot use lambda calculus, the untyped version of lambda calculus, as a logic. Um, there. But But he came out with a form of uh, lambda calculus that could represent numbers. And if you have if you have numbers, you have computation, you can do arithmetic. And then, um, and then he turned he came out with this term called lambda definability, which is kind of like a way of saying uh, if there's a computation that could solve a problem, you could define you can you can define it with lambda calculus. So. For example, the the original Entscheidung's problem, it <laughs> there was a solution, but you could not define it in lambda calculus. And then for the halting problem, the solution. Oh, sorry, for Einstein's problem, you could not define any solution, 
but for the holding problem, you could, you have, you might have a solution, which is you know might be not you might terminate or not terminate, but it's not definable in the lambda calculus. So, uh, so Alonzo Church did this in nineteen thirty three in Princeton, and then nineteen thirty four Kurt Gödel came in and met lambda and met the uh, church and said I was like. I don't believe you. I don't believe that you. You. This is. This is. Lambda calculus is. Uh, it's all there is to it. So, um, Alonzo Church was like, um, why don't you come out with something else, and uh, we see how you know how maybe maybe you can come out with something else better than mine. Uh, so he did. He came out with this thing called uh, general recursive functions. Um, I still don't know what exactly it means, but. Uh, Gödel showed that general recursive functions is equivalent to uh, you could rewrite uh, general recursive functions into uh, lambda calculus and vice versa. So they're equivalent, and this kind of made um, Church doubt himself. Like he actually think that oh, because Gödel came up with this thing, my, maybe my result was my re my result is wrong. Like maybe uh, lambda calculus is not. Uh, Correct, um, but anyway, just a while after all this was happening, the Alan Turing came in with Turing machines. So it's this was kind of like it, most people know what Turing machines are, but like this is kind of the de facto way of representing a computer and how you do computations on a tape. Um, so in the paper, Philip Wetler, no, before that. Um, when Alan Turing came with Turing machines, Gödel finally got convinced that you know maybe all three of our our our, our uh, systems are the same. We could all we could use all three, either one of them, to represent computations. Uh, so in the paper, Philip Weller used this joke that says like, oh, for the the buses thing, right? If you are waiting for a bus, you can wait for a long time. The bus never comes, and then like three comes together at the same time. So you can you can see that the the this all three got discovered uh, within a few years of each other, nineteen thirties. Um, so it was quite a interesting thing, and all three of them discovered all their own systems independently. So um, it's quite a big thing. Uh, okay, so during that time. Uh, Haskell Curry um, actually noticed that there's this equivalence thing where you have a function that goes from A to B. It's, it's the same as uh, implication of A to B. Um, he didn't really explain or elaborate on that, but uh, this other guy called um, William Howard, he was writing some books on Curry and then he actually extended Curry's thought from just the implications to uh, conjunctions, disjunctions, and various other things, uh, including de dependent types. Um, <coughs> so we will expand on this later. But uh <coughs> oh yeah, so it, also in nineteen thirty-five, uh, Jensen. He came up with these two systems, natural reduction and sequence calculus, which is most how most of us do uh, logic now. Uh, writing uh, logic rules, axioms, how do we prove something from this to this. We, most we, mo we use natural reduction mostly. And um, so as you can see, like, there's really a lot of people involved in this whole short history of computer science and formal logic. Um, but right now, we are going to focus on so the paper actually focused on two things, natural reduction and uh, lambda calculus, in specific, specifically the simply typed version of lambda calculus, to show how this, how logic can correspond with computation. Uh, so yeah, let's go into the mechanics a bit. So this whole thing is divided into two parts. On the left side, it is what... Uh, the logic part of it looks like, and on the right side, it's what the computation part of it looks like. 
uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into this. So for the natural reduction part, which is the logic part. Uh, okay, this is some logic thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, some logic thing. Um, so Wattler actually just focused down to two uh, operations. One of them is the conjunction sign. They use he used the uh, ampersand. So this mean okay. So the the idea is that for every logical connective, you have an uh, introduction rule and an elimination rule uh, defined by the i's and the e's. So for this one, it means conjunction introduction, and this one means conjunction elimination. Conjun the introduction rules mean like how do you under what circumstances can you introduce a conjunction sign or like uh, or, in or implication sign? Uh, and the elimination rule says that under what circumstances can you use a uh, conjunction? So you can see that above the line there are no conjunctions, and below the line you can introduce a new conjunction sign. And then for this elimination rule, above the line you have a conjunction sign, and but below the line you don't have it. So it's a way of introducing an operator and, and using it. So in this case, for this part, uh, A and B are all formulas that could either have a true or false uh, value. So this means that assuming that A and B are both true, somehow they're both true, you can conclude A conjunct with B, A and B. And then for this case, if you know that A and B, you know that A is true. This is pretty obvious, this is a pretty basic uh, logic, but like we have to formalize this with our axioms. Uh, for this case, it's the same, but it goes for B. Uh, for the implication introduction, this whole thing means that uh, we are introducing, uh, no, we are assuming A is true. We don't know whether it's true or not, but assuming A is true, and then somehow we get B is true, we can, in, we can conclude with A implies B. Uh, so the x here is just means something like um, kind of like binding it. Uh, we will we will get to this later anyway. So for this case, it's uh, given that if we have a implies b and a, we know that b is true. This is our uh, implication elimination. Yeah. <coughs> so this is an example of a simple proof. Um, how you work out the idea that the idea formula B and A implies A and B. Like to most to most of the people, it, pre it seems pretty similar that you know you have B and A. It should imply A and B. But in order to formalize it, we have to write down a proof. Um, so a proof is basically a combination of different axioms put together, it's kind of like Lego. Uh, but you can trace up, upwards and see like, okay, so if you want to, uh, so if we have, if you assume B and A, we can use uh, conjunction elimination on the left hand side and get B, same thing goes for that. Conjunction elimination on the right hand side, you get A. And then with A and B, we can introduce the ampersand. We can introduce the conjunction. And then once we conclude with this and we assume with B and A, we can say B and A implies A and B. So this is how you build out a basic proof uh, in natural deduction. So, um, so once you have a proof, you might, you know, build up a very, very big proof, but there are some parts in a proof where you might be doing roundabouts, right? Like for example, in this case, um, say you some, somehow in a proof you come to a conclusion that A is true, and somehow in the proof you conclude that B is true, and then you use a conjunction introduction to build A and B, and then you eliminate the conjunction using conjunction elimination, then get A again. It's kind of the same as saying, because you really got A, right? Just conclude with, like, A. 
simplify it. No, you don't, you don't have to do runabouts. But this only works. The pattern here is that um, it's always a pair of uh, implication, uh, introduction and elimination of the same connective. So like this is conjunction elimination, conjunction I and E, and this is implication I and E. Yeah. So this means that so for somehow or other we got to A being true, and then we got to B being true. No, we got to this uh, A implies B. And then since we know that A is true, we can apply uh, impl implication elimination on this, and then we get B. So which is the same as saying, uh, we since really know that A is true, we can conclude that B is true, simplifying the proof. <laughs> okay, this is just like, uh, this is basically, basically saying that this whole thing, using simplification rules, we can simplify to this down, and it means the same thing. Um, okay, so that's the formal logic natural deduction part. Um, next, we go into the computation part, which is using simply typed but calculus, which is kind of like non calculus, but we as put we assign types to the lam the lambda terms. So you might realize that this looks pretty similar to the first uh, the axioms for natural deduction. So instead of using uh, m percent, we are using crosses to represent a pair type. So for a pair uh, M and N, we have a type A times B. We have a pair type A or B. So in this case, this is saying that uh, to, to, to construct a pair type, you need something of type A or something of type B and then by some computation, we can construct a pair type with A and B. Uh, so for this, so this means that given some pair type that you already have, let's say int bool, a tuple of int and bool, you can call, you can create a function that just returns you the first element, which is int in this case. And then for the same goes for this, which is the second element. And then this is how you construct a function lambda calculus. Um, this means that assuming there's a, some if variable x, and then you can conclude that uh, you can return, you'll return a, a type of b, and then conclude a lambda calculus, uh, lambda function that takes in an x and return you a type, uh, something of type a and return you something of type b. I hope that makes sense. And then, uh, for this one, it's very simple. You have a function that goes from A to B, and you have something called uh, something of A. You apply A, you apply this thing to this thing, and you, you get B. Okay. Uh, so this is a program that just swaps two elements in a pair. Uh, starting off, if you have if you have something called Z dot there's of type B and A, and then you get the first element here, you get the second element there. And then you can construct the same, you can construct another pair with using these two elements that goes from A and B, that, that becomes A and B. And then you can conclude that, okay, I can create this program that this function that takes in a pair and then solves the element. Right, so this is, uh, how you would normally evaluate or rather construct a program. Uh, say you have a variable of type X or type A, a variable of type B, you can construct a pair of a tuple of A and B, and you call the first function on it and you get back A. So it's the same as if you the compiler will usually do this, but you simplify this whole chunk down into this chunk. So this is how usually how a compiler works by evaluating programs and then uh, optimizing and simplifying it. Um, so, yeah, this is also, this is also like this, like a previous slide where you have a very very big program, 
and using uh, simplification rules of the axioms, you can simplify the entire program down into just this uh, using evaluation. So after saying that much about all the <laughs> logic stuff, <laughs> uh, the idea here is that um, you can see that the shape of both sides is exactly the same, except for some symbol swapping. But the idea is that you can represent propositions as types. Um, and then if you simplify proofs, it's the, it basically corresponds to evaluating programs. And then, uh, sorry, you could basically construct proof, construct proofs using axioms which is the same as constructing programs using types. And then you could simplify proofs, which, is, which corresponds directly to evalu evaluating programs. So, so back to the part about notion of mystery, about this whole thing. Um, it is... It, this whole idea that, like, you know, you can link up logic and computation has a common, has a common pattern throughout the, the, the short history. For, for, this, for this case, um, Curry and Howard, they both discovered this whole thing together. But there are various other correspondence that you might have used before in computer science and logic that were discovered by two completely different people uh, at, two di at two different times. Um, usually one by a logician and usually one by a computer scientist or mathematician. Um, what, I, what I was talking about was natural reduction and simply type lambda calculus. Um, if, you has, if you have used any form of like ML or Haskell, you might have used, uh, came into contact with type inference, which is done with the hinley milner type inference system, which is discovered by both Hinley and Milner. Uh, System math, which is anything that has to do with like uh, polymorphic polymorphism, um, was discovered by Girard and Reynolds, and then you have various other correspondence as well. Uh, I'm probably not explaining this very well, but this is a very big thing. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so back to this picture. Um, this picture was actually sent out on a pioneer on a spaceship out to okay. some part of space. And the idea is that if an alien were to come across this picture, um, they could see, oh, this is what a, this, a, they probably have to guess what the thing on the right is. <laughs> they, don't, they really don't know what the thing is, but looking on the left, if, if they are sufficiently advanced, like you know, civilization, they might have done some space ex exploration I could possibly deduce that this is the distance of uh, pulsars, I think, from some part in space. Um, from Earth. From Earth, right? From so Seoul, right? They will pick that's a way for them to... Oh, from Sun, sorry. From Sun, yeah, okay. Seoul, yeah. So, um, it's the idea that, like, the thing on the left is kind of universal, or rather within this, within this universe that anything that lives within this universe could kind of understand it. But the thing on the right... <laughs> a bit hard. Uh, that's what we look like. Yeah, that's what we look like. <laughs> so, if you... If, imagine we could include something else in this plaque, right? Imagine we, if we send up a C program or a JavaScript program. There's no way the aliens will be able to understand what a null pointer reference is. Um, and that's a hydrogen or helium atom? I, I think helium. 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 Yeah. Um, in the no, same... It's, it's a hydrogen. It's, hydrogen. Molecule. it's molecule, right? It's not just an atom because you have the two... It's hydrogen. Wow, ah, so one, yeah. one neutron... It's supposed to... It's the, the spins of the atom is supposed to define the timing for the pulsars. Ah. Mm. So that's uh, it's the length of the lines and the length of that line. The ratio is equal to how quickly the how, what's the spinning the pulsar spin rate. So it, it's very smart. You should you should read up this book. It's super interesting how they try to encode all this information in very abstract forms. 
kind is that, of is that related to information theory? Mm-hmm. Not really, but it's just ways to, to so like what is saying, very global, universal ways to mm. define information like time and 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 distance. Right. right. How, how would you explain you know, kilometer to an alien? You can't. But right. You could explain time taken for light to travel, one spin of a electron in mm-hmm. a minute. What's going on? So it's very abstract. Right. So. It, yeah, so it's like how something is very universal, and um, so I was saying, like, imagine you were to set, like, set up a C program versus something written in Lambda Calculus. I would really, it was not clear that the aliens will be able to understand the C program as much mm-hmm. as trying to decipher what Lambda Calculus is, or rather something in basic natural reduction. Um, that kind of makes, it, makes Lambda Calculus a kind of universal concept, right? But also, like because of recent like quantum physics, multiverses, you know, theory. What if there are other universes that you know have fundamentally different constants, which makes the universe work a bit differently? It is it is easy to to understand to, to kind of like you know imagine the universes having different constants, but. It is not that easy to, you know, imagine a universe a universe that natural reduction doesn't work in. So I mean, this is probably a big claim, but Philip Butler actually concludes the um, the paper by saying that lambda calculus, uh, with all its correspondence, with all the correspondence between logic and computation, is actually more than just universal, and calling it universal would be quite limiting. Um, so yeah. Uh, so I guess, like, at the end of the day, uh, at least to me, this paper kind of opens up a lot of doors uh, of like what computer science actually entails, uh, what the study of computer science actually, actually entails, and how many people were actually involved in this whole pursuit of understanding what is not obvious on the surface. Um, <coughs> So I hope you actually got something out of this talk. Uh, so if you have any questions, please throw them at me. If not, thank you so much for attention. Cool. <coughs> the motivation was purely mathematics, or I mean motivation for what? For, for de- deriving some some of those concepts. I think it's it's more of like an accident kind of thing. If I'm not wrong. Like, kind of actually, like, um, like for example, uh, how Curry discovered the implication thing, implication be- being equivalent to a function. It was kind of like um, I don't think they actually worked to find if there were any correspondence between two uh, logic and computation. But once someone kicked it off, this whole chain of like. Uh, Discoveries came out. Yeah. So, um, and and because like. Uh, Be- between the the thirties, forties, so pre, uh, not uh, in terms of date. Yeah. That's what they were thinking in the seventies. Yeah. So there is a. So the up to Turing, it's, it's before the war, and afterward it becomes a, the seventies, the space. The yeah. So for me, there's, there's also like a, like a time in, in type of history aspect. Yeah. So, so actually, uh, William Howard wrote everything on this in 1969. Okay. Um, but nobody, but he, he, he left the, the manuscripts on his table for 11 years until 1980. And only after 1980 did people start to read this stuff and then realize that, hey, there's some kind of isomorphic connection between logic and computation. Which is how like everything else came about, yeah. So actually, there's actually a third part to this. Uh, it's not just logic and computation, but also category theory. So it's a trinitarian trinitarianism kind of like a triangle relationship um, between all these concepts. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I'm curious when you say computation because this is clearly only about type systems. And they are computation that does not involve types at all. Yeah, I, I guess it's a, it's a simplification, hand wavy way of saying like something that's calculable. I guess, effectively calculable. Oh, I, I guess um, 
the way Rattler described uh, what I meant by computation was effectively calculable, which was something that could give an answer to the Einstein that, that, that problem, the uh, Hubert's problem. So, so another calculus is untyped, so later on you only focus on the simply typed calculus, which is purely typed system yeah. question. Yeah. So the correspondence is with logic and type systems, right? Uh, so much logic and computation, which is what you're saying at the end. It's not all. So for example, how does Turing machines come in? Because computation, clearly, you have to talk about Turing machines. And logic yeah, and Turing machines true. don't really have very nice uh, correspondence. Correspondence, yeah. It's more of like a. Like a there's type no real type systems in, in there, yeah. So I guess I was wrong in that, but uh, I can't seem to find a better word to describe this concept. Uh, type systems, yeah. Type systems, yeah. 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 So this is. Where, where is it? Yeah, this thing. Yeah. So everything on the right has some, some, some kind of type system involved in it. Everything on the left is uh, logic, some kind of a logic formal system. Thanks. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, uh, coming from a very engineer perspective, yeah. right, what's the use of this? Ah. Uh. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> well, I can answer it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, basically. The curry Howard correspondence is, is what all the uh, type-based uh, correctness systems are based on. Okay. So if you if you think about okay, so there are two, two ways of thinking of it. One is that if you think about like a dependency type language, right? The the, the reason that they are so powerful is simply because their corresponding logic on the left hand side is expressive enough that you can start encoding meaningful and deep properties of your programs in the types of your program. So then the fact that your program type checks is actually a very meaningful deep result because it proves that it's going to be correct according to the specification that you encoded in the types. Right? But the only reason you can do that, the only reason you can hope to write down a logic uh, specification and then have translated into a type is because there is correspondence between between the two. Mm -hmm. And even if you look at much simpler, much less expressive type systems, like system F or or you know the whatever the thing is that Haskell these days have, and right, even there you, you, you can encode some properties and and, and get them and, and, and then one, once you type check something, you know that it will, it will have those properties. Okay. So basically, th this, this is the reason that type programming is, is such a useful tool. Okay. I guess one question that I have is what, what you brought up, what, which was uh, a lot of code uh, is, is verified. Yeah. Uh, especially in mission critical kind of. Uh, like, like for example, this this called this is like a the, uh, theorem assistant kind of uh, what are they called theorem, a th theorem proof assistant. proving proof, uh, proof assistant. assistant yeah proof, proof assistant. assistant where you could reason reason about things like uh, like I can't see but like it says for all n if you add anything with n it, uh, if you add n zero you get n. These are all very fundamental things that, like, this is what we do in class to do to learn formal logic with. But without the curry Howard isomorphism, there's no way this is can be done because eventually all these theorem proving uh, systems translates down into programs. They are dependent. Uh, they are typed, um, and then using the curry Howard isomorphism, we can guarantee that this is correct. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. What is that too? Uh, cook it's called cock. C O Q. Uh, cock ID. Cock ID. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
It's true. Well, one it's 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 true. It's true. I've read some paper where they said they use some of these tools to actually formalizing the true net or whatever. Yeah. 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 The come from the Inria people. Inria. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. So do you <coughs> ref, 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 ref. No, I, <laughs> I will ask you.